for confidentiality and informed consent issues when working with children and uh, vulnerable adults. There's a few things to keep in mind, legally and ethically speaking. According to our textbook, Remley and Hurley, both of these populations, both vulnerable adults and children, can fall under the same category with respect to their ability to engage in a contractual agreement between themselves and the counselor. Basically, if an adult has been declared legally by the courts to have a diminished capacity, usually it's because of a severe injury, like maybe they're in a medically induced coma or a very, very severe uh, physical or mental illness, or maybe they have uh, some kind of developmental disability. They probably will have a guardian ad litem assigned to them by the court. In that case, uh, as with children and the legal guardian, uh, they sort of have the same rights with respect to the law. And that is basically that they have the right to be supported by the parent or guardian and not be abused or neglected. And so essentially you work for that guardian as the counselor, not for the child. With children, there's a few extra things going on. According to Kuthner in 2017, uh, younger children have less developed concrete reasoning skills. So in addition to the legal ramifications of just being a minor, they may actually lack the ability to understand concepts like confidentiality or even consent. Older children and adolescents will definitely have the understanding, but they tend to strive for autonomy. So you might be sort of at odds with the person you're actually counseling and the person that is your legal client because they will definitely understand what consent is, understand that they don't actually have the ability to give consent and have confidentiality uh, with respect to what they may want versus what their parent or guardian may want. That being said, Remley and Hurley he do point out that uh, many children will say things to counselors with sort of the tacit understanding or even the desire for you to say those things, repeat them to their parent. So it's not always appropriate to just assume that whatever they say to you, they don't want shared. So it might just be a good idea to check in and say, hey, um, would you want us to talk with your parents about this? All of this, uh, whether you're working with a vulnerable population member or with children and even within the family context, all of these uh, sort of nuances should be definitely discussed and added to your informed consent if they're not already there. I do think it is important to have persons sign the informed consent, even if it's not legally binding and you would require a parent or guardian signature on the line below it. I think that it's important to have people involved in decisions that affect them. And any of us like myself who come from education, we uh, strive for this, especially at the high school level when we run 504s or IEP meetings. We really want the student to be a part of those meetings because decisions will be made about them and we want their input on how they think this will help or hurt or affect them. Even if it's not technically their choice, we, we like to be a team decision. That's, I think, usually the ideal here when everyone is working together as a team to solve any of the problems and accomplish the goals. According to Douglas and Ballantine, individuals with diminished capacity, they actually lack the ability to protect their own interests, which could be similar to younger children as well. They suggest using a risk minimization model and sort of balancing out the risk for the individual client who you'll be counseling. So the person you'll be counseling, I guess, not really the actual client. So balancing out that risk versus the individual benefit for the person you're working with. I think that's a pretty good model and that's something that we should definitely be checking in on, uh, not just at the start of counseling, but throughout the counseling process. In my opinion, I don't think you can really consent to something if you don't understand what that something is. But if you start pulling on that thread, I'm not really so sure uh, how much people really have an understanding about what happens in counseling and what the actual risks are from counseling. If you haven't experienced counseling or psychotherapy firsthand or studied it extensively. And so that's where in our informed consent, we sort of lay out, hey, here are some of the things that can happen. But I think it's also important, in addition to having it in the informed consent, to have consistent reassurances and a reminder that we can stop anytime. We don't have to talk about anything you don't want to talk about. You don't have to tell me anything you don't want to tell me. And with children and uh, those more vulnerable population members, I think that might be important to really stress and bring up maybe at the start of every session. But that's just me. What do you guys think?